Hi everyone, this is John Mark Johnson Jr. again, and today I'm making a short video about a topic that came up in one of my various internet feeds. In particular, I'm going to be responding to Chick Tracks. Um, Chick Tracks, as uh, as anyone who's you know vaguely aware of them will know, uh, they're a KJV only uh, group, and um, uh, like a lot of KJV only groups, they're a little bit more on um, at the rabid side as far as this is the the one exact version of scripture that we must use and it is verbally perfect more or less is what they believe um, that this is basically exactly how everything ha has to be said um, they're not KJV only as who would say we prefer this translation they're not KJV only as who would say we believe that this uh, text form is more correct no they would say we want this exact verbiage. It has to be just this way. They wouldn't necessarily say verbally inspired in English, but their beliefs come pretty close to it on a functional level. Um, and of course, I don't have time here to address every single claim that they make because they make a lot of them, but uh, there is one claim that I did want to address, and that is uh, the one that they make that the Bible itself says uh, that the very, very words, exact perfect words, are going to be uh, preserved and there's going to be one basically perfect version of scripture at any given time and place. Okay. Now they use quite a few different scriptures I don't have time to go over all of them but one of them will suffice uh, for my example here and that is Matthew 24 and verse 35. Here's how it reads in the King James Version of the Bible. Heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall not pass away. This is Jesus speaking, and this is what he said, heaven and earth shall, uh, shall pass away, but my words will not pass away. And a lot of KJV onlyists, and in fact actually a lot of Protestants in general, will look at this and say, well here Christ is promising that scripture is never uh, going to fail to be preserved. Scripture is always going to be there. Um, and to a certain extent I would actually agree with that statement, but at the same time, one does does uh, have to keep in mind the original context of where of where this verse fits in Scripture, what is said around it, and one also has to keep in mind the original audience. That is, if you come up with a meaning that would be foreign to those people who originally heard it, who, uh, people who originally received it, then you're basically innovating. You're coming up with something that no one has seen before, and that's wrong. If you're the one who comes out with some special insight that no one before you has seen, and especially not the original audience has seen, then guess what? You're wrong. In church history, we like to call that heresy. So let's take a look at that, the surrounding context of Matthew 24, 35, and make sure that we're understanding it properly as it applies to Scripture. Uh, going just a few verses beforehand, just so that we can get a little bit more context here. Let's start in verse... Um, uh, let's start with verse 32. That'll be de decent. I would definitely recommend that you go back and read all of uh, Matthew 24 if you get the chance, but to give at least the, the basic context of what I'm trying to get across, we can start with 32. Uh, this is still Jesus speaking, of course. He says, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender, and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass, till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. So what's the context here? What is it that we're talking about in general? Well, we're talking about the fulfillment of what God has promised is going to happen, happening. We're basically talking about the fulfillment of scripture, the fulfillment of prophecy. So that's the immediate context. And so in that context of prophecy and things coming to pass that have pro been promised to come to pass, Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So what does that mean in context? What that basically means in context is that what I've promised is going to come to pass. That's what pass away would mean in that uh, context. It doesn't mean that the very words themselves 
are you know going to be written on a, a golden tablet somewhere and it's going to be preserved it doesn't mean that it's going to be preserved in a particular form or in a particular copy or a particular translation or anything like that it's not talking about that it's talking about those things that have been promised regarding end times actually coming to fulfillment okay being uh, done away with okay god's promises will stand heaven and earth are not going to stand they'll be done away with but what God has promised is going to happen will not be done away with. It will stand. That's uh, the basic context. Now, how does that apply to Scripture? Because it's most directly applicable to prophecy in general. It's not actually specifically Scripture. Um, but, of course, a lot of people who look at it would draw a connection between the two. And I would say that's a fair connection because a lot of the things that we have regarding end-time events, of course, are revealed to us in Scripture. So the two do go hand in hand. It's, you know, it's not an error to take um, the one case that we have here and not see in a, a greater application for scripture as a whole. It's not necessarily incorrect to do that. But the question is, in what regard? And particularly, how would people back then have seen it? When uh, Christ uh, said this, would the people then have assumed that he was talking about a particular translation of the Bible? Because that's what's at stake here with KJV only is KJV onlyism, and chick tracks and folks like that. that. Is this promising that there's one particular version of the text? Okay, so you're, you know, uh, imagine yourself as one of uh, Jesus' hearers there. He's uh, talking to, you know, his di uh, disciples most immediately, of course, and they're sitting there listening uh, to this. And of course, at the time that they're listening to this, much of the New Testament really hadn't been written yet. Um, parts of it uh, may have already been started to be memorized and those things because that was pretty common with rabbinical teaching. When someone was teaching things, you would usually take the time to memorize and whatnot. So much of Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, John, um, those parts would have already been in a lot of people's minds and a lot of people's memories. That's true. Um, but as far as the actual written document, um, yeah, it probably didn't exist at that time, especially not in any complete form. And so we have people who are listening to this, they would not have understood it as being a promise regarding scripture, but as a promise regarding um, what Christ has promised, most and uh, foremost. And they would have understood that what Christ has promised is something that would be communicable and transmissible. And this is exactly what the early Christians did. They went out with Christ's message and they communicated it to the people who are around them. Uh, and this is, and we usually find things in a plethora of different languages. Uh, in early Christian uh, writings. Early Christians were very big into translating scripture, um, translating the things of God for people around them, and the scriptures themselves do definitely speak to, uh, to that effect. We have, you know, cases where a particular words from one uh, language will be used, and it shows up uh, directly in scripture itself. Um, uh, one of the most famous examples of this is what Christ says on uh, the cross, you know, Eloi, Eloi, uh, Sabachthani, uh, and so on. He is making an error. Uh, the scriptures quote what he says in Aramaic. Um, uh, and of course, uh, and it also translates it as well. It, it assumes that the idea is transmissible, that it doesn't have to be in this one exact verbal form. Instead, it translates it into the next language. So the emphasis there is on the idea, it's on the concept. And the same thing would have been the case with Matthew 24, uh, 36. In fact, the exact uh, Greek word that's used in Matthew 24, 36 when it talks about the words of Jesus is logoi. And logoi means basically that which has been presented in discourse, usually logically, rationally, um, but essentially that which has uh, been presented in discourse. And so when it's talking about Jesus' words not passing away, it's talking about his statements, his claims, uh, what he's taught, his doctrines, those kinds of things, the things that he's presented. It's conceptual. It's not verbally specific, though. And they would not have understood it as being verbally specific. And even when they translate scripture, when they compose scripture, they do not uh, compose it as being verbally specific. They take something represented in one language, Eloi, Eloi, Sabachthani, and then they go ahead and they translate it. And they leave both of them in there, and they're just fine with that. They say, here's uh, what was said as to what the actual verbal form was, and here's what it means. They're trying to communicate the idea 
the emphasis is always on the idea, not on the exact verbal form. And so this is the problem that I have when KJV only is try to use passages like this to say that there has to be exact one exact verbal form. It doesn't match up with what the surrounding context is first and foremost. The surrounding context is in the case more so of prophecy than it is general than it is scripture as a whole. That being said, prophecy is a part of scripture as a whole, so there is a broader application there. But how is it applied? It is applied as to concept, not as to specific words. And that's how the biblical authors themselves write. They write in multiple languages, and they'll sometimes use multiple languages in the same book, translating it across, so that the ideas, the concepts, can be communicated. They are not verbal uh, isolationists. They're not... Um, and big into exact verbal forms or anything like that, they always believe that it's transmissible, that it's communicable. And of course, KJV only us don't believe that, and that's where my difference is uh, with them. And it's not my difference, technically it's the Bible's. The question is, how does the Bible treat itself? Does it treat itself as being required to be in a one exact verbal form, or does it allow for transmission? Does it allow for multiple representation? so on and so forth. And the answer is, it does allow for multiple representation. It does allow for uh, different languages uh, to be used, and it uses multiple languages, so on and so forth. The KJV only position is not consistent with the Bible, how it presents itself, and it doesn't matter what translation you're looking at. Okay, even the King James will have places where it will quote what is said in Hebrew, or in Aramaic, or whatnot, and it will give a translation next uh, to it, because that's what the original authors did. The KJV uh, translators try to be accurate in those regards, which I'm very thankful for, by the way. Uh, but it does definitely uh, show that an exact verbal form is not what was in the mind of the original authors. It's not what the original recipients would have received. And I've gone on way too long anyways, but hopefully this helps a little bit uh, for someone. I, I know it's a little bit rambly and kind of random, but hopefully it gets the idea across. When you hear people taking the scripture and saying this proves that there has to be one exact verbal form of scripture, you'll go back and you'll actually look at the context and see how it's being used, and you'll also make the distinction whether or not what is being talked about is a concept, is conceptual, that is what is promised is going to happen, or, uh, or that kind of thing, or if it's actually talking about an exact verbal form. And I would guarantee you that if you're honest with what the context is, and you're honest about what the original people would have understood, you're going to come to the conclusion they weren't talking about an exact verbal form. They were talking in the concept uh, as to the concepts. They were talking about that which has been promised as a concept coming to pass. Those things that were taught as concepts being able to be communicated through uh, time successfully. Those kinds of things. Anyways, like I said, I hope this helps. For those of you who are in Christ, go with God and be blessed. For those of you who are not, may you come to an understanding of the true Christ of history, who is the only Savior of mankind. Thank you very much for your time. Bye-bye now.